So today we have um, really an epic chapter in Luke. Uh, so much history is woven into this introduction in Luke chapter 3. Um, and we'll be looking primarily at John the Baptist and his ministry. His job was to prepare the way. And we'll look at at least three ways that I think he was doing that and that God was using him to do that. Um, and it is a properly prepared way, which is our theme for today. A couple of uh, notes about the service. Um, we are going to have a candle lighting uh, of the wreath right now. Um, and um, the uh, hymns are going to be read from the uh, bulletin today. So just reference the bulletin for the hymn numbers. So I believe that it's Katie Forker and Mirth Guest who are going to be lighting our Advent wreath, and I invite them forward to do so. Advent is a season of preparing for the visit of the King we remember. Jesus' first visit to the earth in the incarnation, humbly ca cried, carried in the womb of the Virgin Mary. We also look forward to the second return of our Lord coming in the cloud with glory. For many years, the church used purple for the color of Advent, recalling both the royalty of Christ and the need for repentance at his, his return. We recall that Jesus wore a glorious purple robe, which was placed on him by the soldiers in order to mock him. But Advent has a spirit of hope within it, distinct from Lent. We look forward with an expectant heart, looking forward to the final return of Christ. When Martin Luther explained his famous rose seal, he described the color blue this way. This rose should stand in a sky blue field, symbolizing that a joyful spirit and faith is a beginning of heavenly pure joy, which begins now, but is grasped in hope not yet fully revealed. This hopeful expectation is reflected in Christ's words about his final return in a time when things are most distressing. But when these things begin to take place, straighten up and lift up your heads because your redemption is drawing near. This comes from Luke 21, verse 28. Our scripture verse today recalls both the repentance and the joy of grace which John preached about baptism. And John came into all the region around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, from Luke 3, verse 3. We shall pray. Lord, Lord Jesus Christ, we look forward to your coming in the clouds with great power. May your word and gracious Holy Spirit create in us a clean heart, trusting in your mercy alone to welcome you rightly. In your great name we pray. Amen. Thank you, ladies. And our opening hymn is hymn number 344. We sing verses 1, 2, 3, and 5 on Jordan's Bank, the Baptist Cry.
Today we follow Divine Service Setting 2 on page 167 in your hymnal. It's also printed in your bulletin. We make our beginning in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We go to our Lord in confession. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Forgive us. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, and renew us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways for the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, to die for you and for me. And for his sake, he forgives us all of our sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all of your sin. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our psalm today is a portion of Psalm 66. We read it responsibly. Shout joyfully to God, all the earth. Say to God, how awesome are your works. Because of the greatness of your power, your enemies will pretend to obey you. All the earth will worship you, and will sing praises to you. They will sing praises to your name, Come and see the works of God, who is awesome in his deeds toward the sons of mankind. He rules by his might forever. His eyes keep watch on the nations. The rebellious shall not exalt themselves. Selah. Who keeps us in life and does not allow our feet to slip. You brought us into the net. You laid an oppressive burden upon us. You made men ride over our heads. We went through fire and through water. Yet you brought us out into a place of abundance. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. for the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. This is the feast of victory for our God, alleluia.
May the Lord be with you. Today's collect is at the top of page 5 in your bulletin. Please open your hearts and your minds and join with me in this prayer. Let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, Word of God, in your mercy hear our prayer. Lord, we praise you for the rich resources you have provided to us in your sacred scriptures. May we see in them that our faith is founded on fact, historical and geographical truth and your entrance into creation by the wonder of the Incarnation. You are the Word made flesh, and you came to this creation of yours to reveal the holy life you call us to. All flesh may see the salvation of God. We thank you that John the Baptizer was the fulfillment of your promise that someone would prepare your way. By your grace, the gift of faith, may we live as your children, staying on the way, the truth, and the life. In your name we pray. The Old Testament reading is taken from Malachi chapter 3. Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, and the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming, and who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver, and they will bring offerings in righteousness to the Lord. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord, as in the days of old, and as in former years. Then I will draw near to you for judgment. I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers, against the adulterers, against those who swear falsely, against those who oppress the hired worker in his wages, the widow and the fatherless, against those who thrust aside the sojourner and do not fear me, says the Lord of hosts. For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. From the days of your fathers you have turned aside from my statutes and have not kept them. This is the word of our Lord. The epistle reading is from Philippians chapter 1. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you, all making my prayer with joy, because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I'm sure of this, <clears throat> that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to feel this way about you all, because I hold you in my heart, for you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in my defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness, how I yearn for you and all the, with, with all the affection of Christ Jesus. It is my, and it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve what is excellent, so you, so, and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with, the joy, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. This is the word of the Lord. We rise for the verse of the day and our gospel reading. In your bulletin near the bottom of page 5, you'll find today's verse from Luke chapter 3, verse 4. Please join with me as we read it together. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, the voice of one calling out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. The Holy Gospel for the second Sunday in Advent is recorded in Luke chapter 3, beginning at the first verse. Glory 
In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea and Herod being tetrarch of Galilee and his brother Philip tetrarch of the region of Iturea and Trachonitis and Licinius tetrarch of Abilene. During the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. And he went into all the region around the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, as it is written in the book of the words Isaiah the prophet. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall become straight, and the rough places shall become level ways, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. He said, therefore, to the crowds that came out to be baptized by him, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come, bear fruits in keeping with repentance. And do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able to raise up from these stones even children to Abraham. Even now the axe is laid at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. And the crowds asked him, what shall we do? And he answered them, whoever has two tunics is to share it with him who has none. And whoever has food is to do likewise. Tax collectors also came to be baptized and said to him, teacher, what shall we do? And he said to them, collect no more than you are authorized to do. And soldiers also asked him, and we, what shall we do? And he said to them, do not extort money from anyone by threats or false accusation, and be content with your wages. This is the gospel of our Lord. Our sermon hymn is hymn 346, When All the World Was Cursed, we sing verses 1, 2, and 3. Grace, mercy, and peace to you in our Lord Jesus Christ. John the Baptist was the preparer of the way for us to believe in Christ Jesus, who is the only way of salvation according to Scripture. He has made an entirely new way of living, and he introduces that by being born again or born from above. Through repentance, through grace, the gift of faith, 
and a new way of bearing fruit. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the abundant life that he directs us every day to live. John the Baptist, the name you probably know well and for good reason. He is mentioned in all four Gospels. He is also mentioned in the book of Acts. He is mentioned prophetically in the Old Testament, in the book of Isaiah, as you heard read earlier, as written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And as you heard in the Old Testament reading, he's also mentioned in Malachi prophetically. John is also mentioned in the first century by the Jewish historian Josephus, who writes this about John and Herod Antipas. Now, to some of the Jews, the destruction of Herod's army seemed to come from God as just recompense, a punishment for what he did to John, who was called the Baptist. For Herod had executed him, though he was a good man and had exhorted the Jews to exercise virtue both in practicing justice towards one another and in piety towards God and so doing, to join in baptism. Besides John the Baptist, who is introduced in Luke 3 today, we also have seven other political or religious leaders of prominence. These figures have their location, the regions where they operate from, and the time in which they operate. It is as if God is giving us a very accurate 3D picture or roadmap of exactly what he is up to in the redemption account. And this makes good sense, since God has already given us his word in the Old Testament. He now makes it clearer in the New Testament. The roadmap has become more accurate, so to speak, or at least more defined, more specific. It's a unique roadmap. It's a map that is, in fact, the way. It is the logos, the word of God. It is active. It doesn't just sit there. It is also, in another way, the very vehicle that takes us where we're going to faith in Christ and fellowship with the eternal God. Paul Meyer, who some people know of because he is not only a Missouri Synod Lutheran, but he is a very famous historian, wrote the book called The Fullness of Time. And it takes a look at the Christian account of Jesus and the Gospels and the book of Acts, and it looks at outside records of Jesus and these same events. He introduces this entire book by talking about history in general and why Christianity is truly unique. Listen to his words. Of all religious beliefs in the world, past or present, none have more thoroughly based themselves on history than Judaism and Christianity. The divine human encounter in biblical faiths always involves claims about real people in real places who acted in real events of the past, many of whom are cited in secular or ancient history. Now, comparing that with other faiths, Meyer has this to say about the difference between Christianity and almost all other faiths. Because Judeo-Christianity has thoroughly influenced our Western culture, we are prone to imagine that all other world religions have similarly a solid base in history. This is by no means the case. It can, in fact, be argued that every religious system before or since Judaism and Christianity has avoided any significant interaction with history. The Lord wants his roadmap, called the Bible, to be testable. He lays it open before us and says, investigate it, see if it is true. Now, make no mistake, there have been times in history when Scripture does not align perfectly with what we know from history. But my argument would be that historical research is still carrying on. They are doing research continually. And as Meyer likes to say, the further we get from the events, the closer we get to the accuracy because we discover more and more. A couple of examples. So until the 1960s, there was no epigraph. There was no uh, name imprinted on a building or a coin or anything else uh, that would identify Pontius Pilate. He was mentioned in writings but in nothing more substantial. In 1961, they found in Caesarea Maritima, the very same Romanized city that Herod the Great built, where Paul was held captive by Felix and Festus, an inscription on a building that was dedicated to Tiberius Caesar, the very same Tiberius mentioned in our reading today, who was reigning simultaneously with Pontius Pilate, and it had Pilate's name inscribed on that stone. 
God waited a couple of millennia before revealing that particular piece of evidence. This guy who we don't know in many places at all, uh, Licinius Tetrarch of Abilene. Uh, he's not mentioned elsewhere in Scripture, and he's not prominent elsewhere. Uh, he is mentioned a couple of places, and in the last century, about the middle of it, there were some historians who said, Luke made a mistake. We have a record of a guy named Lysanias who died in 34 B.C., way before the time that Jesus was ministering. Well, about that time that they were raising that criticism, they did discover in Abilene a text that mentioned that, yes, in fact, Licinius, tetrarch of Abilene, was living simultaneous with, with Tiberius Caesar. So these things sometimes take centuries or even millennia for God to show us, and he won't indeed show us all his hand. He wants us to trust his text. But it has proven to be reliable. I think that as history marches on, we will have more discoveries. God is telling us that his scripture should be trusted, even by the skeptics. They should read it. But more significant than looking for extra biblical areas to support scripture, whether it be archaeology or other sources of writings, let's take a look at the meaning of John's ministry and realize how profound this scripture today is. John the Baptist literally is carrying on a ministry in the Jordan River. You might think of it as, as though he's building a road in the river. I'd like to say geography is oftentimes theology. So this is a strange place to build a road. We may recall that the Israelites, in fact, crossed this river around 1500 B.C. or 1500 years earlier, and the text was referenced in our psalm today telling the story again about a thousand or, or excuse me, about 446 years after it occurred. Come and see the works of the Lord, who is awesome in his deeds towards the Son of Mankind. He turned the sea into dry land, and they passed through the river on foot. Let's rejoice there in him. Let's rejoice in the river with him or in him. What's this all about? Well, John was baptizing people in the Jordan River because it was a new conquest. Just as the Israelites had crossed there 1446 B.C., they were also crossing through now with Jesus in the waters of baptism. Jesus was going to establish a new kingdom, and really it's only new in the fact that he has new adherents. He has always been the king, but now he's going to become a much more prominent king. The king has come back and visited his people and is making himself present. And in the waters of Jesus' own baptism, the Holy Spirit would descend in the form of a dove, and we would get to see and hear the triune God revealed in the baptismal waters of Jesus' baptism and John who baptized him. John's baptism was new. It was something that was completely unique. There were lots of sort of Jewish baptisms that were going on, but John's was historic, and it had been put on the map at Jesus' baptism when the Holy Spirit and God the Father revealed themselves. John was giving them a new way. And yes, there was forgiveness of sins, according to this text in John the Baptist. But it wasn't until Jesus' Trinitarian baptism that we had a fuller magnification of what God was going to do for the rest of the saints. We would be baptized into Christ. John's road was a road of repentance and forgiveness of sins. He would point to Jesus and say, there's the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. So just as God did in the Old Testament by opening up the Red Sea and then later on opening up the Jordan River, in both cases he miraculously did it, and they passed through the river, God made a path in a place where there was surprisingly no path and there shouldn't have been a path. You don't have paths in seas. You don't have a river that is also a road. So I'll share a story with you that helps us appreciate what I think is the radical nature of this new road that John was building by God's direction. So when I was a brand spanking new driver in Cleveland, Ohio, I went to the big city alone, having never driven there alone before. 
uh, and I was a teenager, and got on a road that I thought I was familiar with, I turned onto it from a smaller road, and there I was facing six lanes of traffic coming right at me. Now, I happen to know that this road, I was so sure this road was a two-way road, but what I didn't realize that in Cleveland at the time, and although I believe they've changed it because probably a lot of other people made the same mistake I did, they used to efficiently move traffic by changing the lights at rush hour. And so in the day that people were coming into town, the lights would be, majority of them would be green going in, and then there were a couple lanes that were for one or two out. Uh, and then the middle of the day would be two-way traffic, and then later on they'd switch it the other way. Very efficient, but sometimes it must have caused accidents because they don't do it anymore. That's what happens when people realize that they can't save themselves. I am going the wrong way. And until they get that sort of revelation, that clear teaching, we fool ourselves into thinking, well, this is the way it usually goes. There's a way that seems right unto man, but the proverb adds, that way is the way to death. This idea that we're saved by grace through faith in Christ Jesus is radical. It's completely opposite to what most people think. And it is radically introduced by this way that John is making in the wilderness through not only uh, the wilderness region, but especially through the waters of the Jordan River. Luke 3.3, 3, he went into all the region around the Jordan proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Seeing is believing. When people got to see Jesus, they also would see God. There's something about God visiting his people in the flesh that's very much related to the idea of the sacrament. Jesus, who could touch a leper with his hand and bring healing, restoration, and wholeness, bringing him back to his people that he was segregated from. That's very similar to baptism. Or a voice that could raise the dead, the power of the word to bring life. Another strong, significant message that God's sacraments are efficacious. And ultimately, what's the verse say? It brought forgiveness of sins. So when the word repentance in you is used in the Bible, it literally means a change of mind. But that doesn't really sound as significant as what it is. Think of a brain transplant or a heart transplant. Those are the things you can't do yourself. So God is doing a wondrous work, not only in the waters of baptism, but in the ministry of John. And when he says, all flesh shall see the salvation of God, He's talking about this connection between the flesh and the spirit. And if you think about it, there's something unique about the way Christianity magnifies the material, emphasizes the body and blood along with the spirit of God. Think about these verses. Jesus, during the Passover where he instituted communion, drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Or Zacharias, the father of John the Baptist. And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give to his people the knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of their sins. And Peter said to the early church in Acts chapter 2, Repent, and let each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promises for you and your children. Connecting the Spirit with water and the word. And finally, the writer of Hebrews, chapter 9, verse 22, and according to the law, one may almost say that things are cleansed with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Christianity is a very strange religion indeed, a peculiar religion, and yet it reflects so beautifully the incarnation. God, the word, made flesh. So when John is really filling, fulfilling the Old Testament prophecy, all flesh shall see the salvation of our God, it's clear that he's talking about God now coming down with his people in the man Christ Jesus. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. We also discover in John's ministry 
that this is not just a material taught faith about the incarnation, Jesus in the flesh, and the, and the gifts of the sacraments having not only a material part but a spiritual part, but there's also a very practical side of Christianity. This road, this path, this way, and the early Christians were known first as the way, was a whole different way of living. John would say in his preaching today, heard earlier, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not begin to say, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able to raise up from these stones children of Abraham. You can't have a stone-like faith. Genuine Christian faith is dynamic. It is rooted in Christ's love. It is connected to Jesus, who is the vine, and we are the branches, and we are to grow fruit. Another driving story. I've got a lot of debacle driving stories. When my wife and I were blessed to go to Scotland several years ago, we discovered what it's like to drive on the wrong side of the road. They drive on the wrong side of the road over there. <clears throat> we're right. Being a cheapskate, I also rented a car that was a stick shift, so I had the stick shift on the wrong side of the car. What was even more confusing were the roundabouts. And you think we're really cool because we got a couple of roundabouts. There are roundabouts everywhere in Scotland, and some of them are actually on freeways. Their roundabouts are multi-lane roundabouts. But what I discovered was that when I think about a road, I think about you know, a number and a direction. 81 north, 71 south, 17 east. Rarely do they use those things. Instead, they use names. You gotta know the geography. Dumachter, Dundee, Dunfermline. And it just might be in the direction of the city that you know the name of, but you'd have no idea of these roads in between and the name of the city in between. The Scots know these places because they've been raised there. And so they know where they're going. When John the, baptized, John the Baptist baptized tax collectors and soldiers, his answers are not necessarily profound, are they? These are things that you would almost expect a tax collector or a soldier to know, and yet it seems as though they didn't do it. Part of bearing fruit is hearing once again those basic things that we should know. John gave them an application that was specific to their vocation. You are teachers, you are students, you are parents. The applications seem obvious enough, but sometimes we miss them. And that's one of the reasons why you come to church. There is a pruning that goes on when the law is taught. Students shouldn't cheat. Duh! And yet I hear all the time that it goes on. Workers shouldn't be lazy. And yet I hear all the time that they are. Fathers shouldn't lose their temper. That one hits close to home. The life in the church is both about learning the landscape or the geography of Jesus, and it's also learning about the way to live in Christ. Bearing fruit is, in fact, natural. But sometimes there needs to be that pruning, that fertilizing, that additional work that the fruit may grow. John said, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. Forgiveness is fruitful. Right away, I want to do something in return for Christ. You may remember that back in the 60s, when billboards started popping up everywhere, it was Lady Bird Johnson who looked at those billboards and in Texas came to the conclusion, you know, we should probably have some flowers. And so she went on this campaign to plant flowers. And her legacy lives on today. In our epistle reading, Paul says that our love is like a flower or a fruit. And it shouldn't be like just there. What does he say? And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and discernment that you may approve what is excellent. Love should grow. Fruit should grow. You shouldn't be the same place where you were yesterday. 
But the beauty is for Christians who are connected to Christ the vine, who are baptized on the road of redemption, who are washed, and that's really the way baptism works. It's a continual renewal, identity cleansing. That in the church we have these rest stops. This is one of them. Where you let go of the stuff that you don't need and you refresh yourself in the refreshments of redemption, the word and the sacrament. The beautiful thing is that as Christians, we've already reached our destination. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And when we are on him, we have arrived. We have all that we need in our faith in Christ Jesus. And so what do we do? We go along this journey with him, keeping in step with the Holy Spirit, being renewed every day by his love more and more. Amen. I mean, this, the gospel of God, strengthen your hearts and minds that you would stay on the way and bear fruit while doing so, keeping in step with God himself, who is with you. Amen. We rise and we sing the uh, same sermon hymn, verse 4, hymn 346, When All the World Was Cursed. On page 174 in your bulletin, you'll find the Creed of the Church, the Nicene Creed. We profess our faith together. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from one of heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. This time we gather your offerings and prayers. You may be seated. We pray. Lord God Almighty, we thank you for your word, which is reliable, trustworthy, based in things that can be tested, and yet asks us to believe things that cannot be tested. The incarnation, the forgiveness of sins through Christ Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for your word, which is able to carry us where we cannot go on our own. We pray, Lord, that the church truly would be the way, that we would be bearing fruit naturally connected to Christ, knowing that we have arrived. In your name we pray, amen. A uh, prayer from the Thompson family for a new puppy who joined us. Uh, they, the cats have not declared war yet, it says here. 
I have a new cat, and we're praying that it doesn't destroy the house. So, uh, and and uh, my my grace to the Thompsons who do a wonderful job in the balcony, and I, I wasn't so kind to them beginning our worship today. Let's rise for these prayers and the Lord's prayer. Lord God Almighty, we thank you for all of your creation, the visible and invisible. We thank you for our pets. Uh, we pray your blessing upon the, the new addition to the Thompson family. Uh, we thank you for the great work that they do in your kingdom. Uh, we ask, Lord, your blessing upon the entire church also as we enter into a new year in the season of Advent, um, and we are looking forward to... Um, new opportunities for mission, that you would also give us clarity as we continue to discuss and pray about what is your will regarding uh, things as simple as wearing masks. Uh, so we pray, Lord, that you would bless us as a church, that we would be unified, trusting in you. In Christ's name we pray, amen. And um, as I mentioned, Thanksgiving Eve, when we had communion at the rail, we will do it again at Christmas time. In the meantime, we're continuing to do communion uh, at the tables. So we prepare with the preface. May the Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and proper, Lord, that at all times we should give you thanks. We give you thanks in the season of Advent that you came the first time, and we look forward to your return at the end of time. Come, Lord Jesus. Therefore, we evermore praise you and sing. Blessed are you, Lord of heaven and earth, for you have had mercy on those whom you created and sent your only begotten Son into our flesh to bear our sin and be our Savior. With repentant joy, we receive the salvation accomplished for us by the all-availing sacrifice of his body and blood on the cross. Gathered in the name and the remembrance of Jesus, we beg you, O Lord, to forgive, renew, and strengthen us with your word and spirit. Grant us faithfully to eat his body and drink his blood as he bids us to do in his own testament. Gather us together, we pray, from the ends of the earth to celebrate with all the faithful the marriage feast of the Lamb and his kingdom, which has no end. Graciously receive our prayers. Deliver and preserve us. To you alone, O Father, be all glory, honor, and worship with the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Our Lord Jesus Christ, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had supped and given thanks, he gave it to them and he said, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. As often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, in giving us your body and blood to eat and to drink, you lead us to remember and confess your holy cross and passion, your blessed death, your rest in the tomb, your resurrection from the dead, your ascension into heaven, and you're coming for the final judgment. So remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, 
hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. May the peace of the Lord be with you always. Now may this, our Lord's true body and blood, strengthen and preserve each of you in the true faith and the life everlasting. Go with God's grace, his joy, his peace, following the way. give thanks to you, almighty God, that you have refreshed us through the salutary gift. And we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same in faith towards you and in fervent love towards one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with his favor, giving you his peace. <laughs>